Yeah, my name is Jared Urban. I am the State Natural Areas Volunteer Coordinator for Wisconsin DNR. And I'm gonna be talking today about some state natural areas that I really enjoy and that you could as well, how to enjoy them, what's special about them, and um, show a few pictures of them as well. Um, and so to do this, I've got a team of people that are helping me uh, present. And so I'm gonna let them introduce themselves too. Sure, so. I, can, I can go next. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Kate Williamson. I'm the Director of Conservation Programs here at the Natural Resources Foundation. Uh, and that means uh, I get to work uh, really closely with folks like Jared and Thomas, uh, others at the DNR and our other conservation partners really to um, direct our grant initiatives, uh, conservation programs here at the foundation. So I'll be speaking a little bit about how here at NRF we help support SNAs. Thomas? Thanks, Kate. And hello, everybody. My name is Thomas Meyer. I'm a conservation biologist with the DNR State Natural Areas Program. I've been with the program since the early 1990s. Um, my position today is to sit in the background and answer any questions that you have that I can answer uh, via the chat feature function. And Jamie, presumably, will tell us a little bit more about how to do that. Um, so I will do my best to answer your questions. The ones that I can't answer via the chat function, I will uh, defer to, um, to Jared to answer later on. So again, thanks for joining us. And hi everyone, my name is Jamie Kanowski. I am the Communications Coordinator with the Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin. And today I am also hanging out in the background just to make sure everything runs smoothly, um, help monitor the chat function at the bottom. We are also recording the webinar today, so you'll be able to watch it later on. We'll also be sharing out the actual PowerPoint presentation as a PDF, so you can view it at your own pace. And all of that will be available on our website, um, on our virtual field trips page. The easiest way to find that is just by going to our homepage at wisconservation.org. And there is a button right there in the middle of the page that takes you to our virtual field trips. Um, we're doing that every Friday. If you haven't been tuning in, please do. It's our Field Trip Friday series that we're doing this summer and spring as we're unable to be out in the field together in person. And um, then we have a couple of really cool trips coming up. So um, yeah, turn it back over to you, Jared. I think for now, should the rest of the co-hosts, should we go ahead and just mute ourselves so you can jump into the actual presentation? Sounds good. So um, you can see this, right? Just to confirm. Yes, I can see it. Okay. So um, in your Zoom window, if you would like to engage in the chat, um, you can ask questions at any point and you can scroll into the window and find that there's a, a chat icon at the bottom. Click on that and then you can enter your question over on the right hand side. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of the State Natural Areas Program first. We have the oldest and largest state nature preserve system in the country, in Wisconsin. Um, the program began in 1951, and the first state natural area that they chose to um, make a state natural area was Parfrey's Glen, which is a gorgeous site um, shown in this photo. So this is a map of almost all of the state natural areas in Wisconsin. There's almost 700 and they're present in every county except for two counties. So wherever you live in the state, you're going to be able to find an SNA that's close to you. The other cool thing about this map is that you can see um, areas of natural diversity where there's a lot of SNAs um, concentrated. So along the lower Wisconsin State Riverway, the Southern Kettle Moraine, the Northern Kettle Moraine, Door County, the Northern Highland American Legion State Forest, and then other smaller concentrations along the St. Croix and in Jackson County. The sites are owned by a, a variety of partners as well as by DNR. The majority are owned by DNR but also uh, 
land trusts, nonprofits, national forest, um, and others own um, SNAs. In order to become an SNA, the site has to be special in one of three categories. It has to have rare plants and animals, it has to have ge rare geological features or archeological features present. Um, and our main goal when we acquire an SNA is to not develop it. If there's a, a trail that exists, we'll leave the trail. But um, our program is not going to put out a lot of picnic areas, um, make roads, campgrounds, that sort of thing. Um, we do have SNAs within state parks that have trails on them, and other SNAs have already had um, trails on them, and so they will continue to have um, trails. But a lot of our sites do have uh, truck trails, like the picture that's shown, that if you know the site, you can walk around and get around fairly easily. To find SNAs near you, you can go to our website, dnr.wi.gov, and search for SNA or State Natural Area, and you'll find our website. And then you can search by county or by name of a specific SNA to find them. You can also utilize the guides that we have on our website that show things like how to find sites for good spring wildflower displays or fall colors. Uh, or sites that you can uh, do some great paddling. So we have uh, a few staff based in Madison and also some field crews that are spread around the state. We have nine field ecologists that are each, re each responsible for a region and they help to direct um, people with NDNR and partner agencies on management of rare plant and animal communities. And our field crews are out on the ground um, doing things most days um, out in the field. One of their main jobs is removal of invasive plants. And they also do things like conduct uh, prescribed fires, collect seeds, plant seeds, um, do uh, rare uh, plant and animal surveys, some research, um, and they range in size from one to seven people, usually covering an average of eight counties apiece. And so uh, there's a lot of work to be done. I coordinate our volunteer program, which started in 2011 and became official in 2014. Um, we have some of the most um, enthusiastic and knowledgeable people in the state uh, volunteering for us. Uh, it helps us to expand the work that we do. Um, and if you would like to learn more about what we do, you can check out our annual reports. Um, you can find that by going to our webpage, which you can find on the State Natural Areas webpage, or by searching dnr.wi.gov for um, state natural areas volunteers. The annual report links are off on the right hand side and they show lots of photos and some stories and so you can get a sense for what we do. In 2019 we impacted 49 different sites with over 5,500 hours and on if in normal conditions we have work days going on every week and so you can sign up for email updates in your region of the state, um, and you can get um, notifications whenever there are work days occurring. So I wanted to show this slide because not many people know where our funding comes from. Um, you'll notice that in this pie chart, this pie piece here, this one here, this one here, and a good short chunk of this uh, piece here are all from grant and gift funds. So over 80% of our program is funded through grants and gifts, not from taxes, not from the legislature. And a good chunk of this gray piece right here is funded by 
um, the Natural Resources Foundation. They donate um, funds to us to get more work done. And Kate is gonna talk about that. Sure, thanks, Jared. Um, so hi everyone, this is Kate Williamson. Like I said, I'm the Director of Conservation Programs with the Natural Resources Foundation. And just a little bit of background on us if you're not familiar. We were founded back in 1986 to provide sustainable funding for Wisconsin's most imperiled species in public lands while connecting generations to the wonders of Wisconsin's lands, waters, and wildlife. Um, really our founders back in, in the 80s had the goal of connecting private citizens and private sector funding to ensure that our natural resources really were adequately cared for, you know, given the limitations with state funding. Uh, so today, uh, many of you know, if you participate in our field trip program and we're able to actually be outside and exploring, you know, SMAs and other places, you know that we're all about connecting people to Wisconsin and our natural heritage. We provide incredible expert-led field trips and tons of unique topics all over Wisconsin. We also have a new program called Wayfarers that's connecting 20 and 30 somethings to Wisconsin's outdoors. So if you know any millennials, feel free to connect them to that program. And we provide many other ways for people to learn about and experience our lands, waters, and wildlife, including getting students outside and hands-on with nature, supporting programs like the Master Naturalist Program and Citizen Science Projects. Um, really great stuff. It's so important to connect people to what we have in the state. Um, but the other part of our mission, providing sustainable funding, um, is another really important aspect. And that's the part that really I focus on in my, in my role with the foundation. Um, sorry, Jared, I'll, I'll let you know when to, to go to the next slide. Um, sorry. No worries. <laughs> um, and then, so we really work to secure funding and provide support to invest in projects, programs, and organizations that support the highest priority conservation needs in Wisconsin and build strong partnerships to really make that happen with partners like the DNR and, and many others across the state, nature centers, nonprofits, land trusts. Um, you know, we have a really robust network of partners that we're working on on conservation projects. Right, next slide, please. So each year we invest nearly $1 million to directly support more than 150 conservation and environmental education projects across the state. I think not a lot of folks, you know, if you're familiar with our field trip program, realize the pretty significant impact we're having for conservation work. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and really we focus our efforts on projects that of course connect people to nature, but also help protect our most rare and threatened wildlife and plant species and conserve our most cherished landscapes across the state with a special focus on SMAs since there are, you know, the most biodiverse places in the state, protecting the last remaining natural communities and really providing um, some of the last habitat for our most uh, endangered and threatened wildlife species too. So really we're an important hub for conservation support in the state. Um, and I'll talk just a little bit about some of the ways that we help secure funding too. Um, but really, we, we work to build capacity for conservation and environmental education work and, and build these partnerships to move key conservation projects forward, whether that's landscape scale restoration projects in the driftless area, for example, or advancing pollinator conservation work at a statewide scale, or helping to address environmental education needs by working with teachers, the Department of Public Instruction, and others. So we're involved in a lot of different really great work across the state. Uh, next slide. Oh, thanks, Jared. So as I mentioned, one of our key focus areas is public lands in Wisconsin. And in fact, we're one of the only statewide groups focused on state managed and state owned public lands. So those managed by the DNR in the state. Each year we provide support for dozens of DNR properties. Um, including state parks, wildlife areas, fishery areas, and of course, state natural areas. We provide funding that supports habitat management for wildlife, that restores our most unique and imperiled natural communities, and we even provide support for infrastructure, such as trail building and maintenance, campground rehabilitation, and more. We know that Wisconsin, as you do, has such um, amazing public lands, and we're so happy to be here to support them. And we do that through providing donations to the DNR to ensure that this important work happens. But we also connect people um, to these special places through our field trip programs, 
through volunteer events like National Public Lands Day and the SNA Work Days that Jared was just mentioning, uh, and much more too. Like I said, you know, our, we really have a focus on state natural areas because these are just such special places. And as you saw from Jared's pie chart, the SNA program really is in need of funding. Um, a lot of that work um, that we provide support for just wouldn't happen without donations. So the funding that NRF helps secure supports restoration and management work. Um, you know, last year alone, we supported work at dozens of state natural areas all over the state, um, from our Mississippi Bluff sites to our Great Lakes shores, from southern Wisconsin's prairies and savannas, all the way up to our Northwoods, you know, last remaining old growth sites. Um, so SNAs, as we know, why we're all here on this webinar, there's such uh, incredible places that we have here in Wisconsin, and we're super glad to be a, an important part of protecting them. So next slide, please. Okay, I, I, this is Jamie. I did receive a request. If you could um, unhide your camera, uh, there are a few folks who could use um, seeing your face to help. Oh, with sure. I'm audio. happy to and uh, for every other participant, we will transcribe some of those notes and put them in the uh, PowerPoint slide later so you can take a look at some of those more detailed um, happy notes to. that Kate was sharing. Okay. All right, so I wanted to briefly share how we do work and help support state natural areas, kind of what that, what that looks like behind the scenes. Um, so, you know, our staff really works hard to, like I said, secure funding for um, many conservation projects, including state natural areas. So we do that um, by securing donations from individuals just like you. We have more than 5,000 members all across the state. Um, we also work with small businesses, corporations, foundations, um, really all sorts of groups to connect people and organizations to the places that they really care about across Wisconsin, including some of our state natural areas. Um, we partner, one thing I did want to mention, and I know I have a slide on this next, is one of the unique ways that we're working with corporations, for example, like REI, to um, connect their employees and philanthropic um, work to state natural areas. So I'll talk about that next. Um, we also work with folks who are interested in making major or planned gifts, which can really result in a tremendous amount of conservation work that can be done, really including landscape scale, restoration efforts. It's pretty incredible what can happen um, through philanthropy. Um, and then one of the important ways that we provide support is through our Wisconsin Conservation Endowment. Um, most of you folks are probably familiar with how endowments work, but they're a really great financial tool that allow um, donations to grow through the market and then annually distribute um, a portion of funds to support um, either a, in our instance, a priority state natural area or a specific SNA, for example. So we have funds that go, that are set up by donors, for example, to support the highest priority needs at sites. And that really depends on the year. Um, we also have funds that are set up to support very specific places like Parfreeze Freeze Glen, Chewaukee Prairie, Quincy Bluff and Wetlands. Um, and those are really important for, for field crews, really valuable because they can count on that annual funding each year to get management done at those sites. So that's a really neat way that we're providing support. Go ahead to the next slide, Jared. Thank you. So as I mentioned, one of the fun ways that we're um, starting to um, have an impact on SNAs is by building these partnerships with um, businesses. And one of the ways that we've done that is with REI, which if you're like me, I was already a big fan. Now I'm an even bigger fan. Uh, so that's really fun because we are able to work with them um, to get really great work done at places like Park Rees Gun, which is pictured here. Uh, so we work with them to um, secure funding through their corporate grant programs. And that funding actually hires the field crews that Jared was mentioning to go out and do really great work on the ground. Um, but then what's cool too is that we actually partner on volunteer work days. So we get REI um, encourages their employees and their members of the co-op to go out and do volunteer work. We promote it to our NRF members. Uh, and then the SNA volunteer program, uh, Jared helps coordinate that and a bunch of other volunteers come out from the public too. So it's getting really great work done and engaging tons of people in hands-on uh, volunteer opportunities. So we've been doing that 
at places like Parfreeze Glen, East Bluff. I know we have Chiwaki Prairie and Wabisa Wetlands coming up later this year. So that's just a really fun, fun way that we're engaging um, corporations and giving back to SNEs too. All right, next slide. And just one last example of how NRF is helping to support SNAs. Um, hopefully, a lot of you have heard of the Cherished Wisconsin Outdoors Fund. Um, that's a public private partnership that we helped establish. It um, raises funds into an endowment, again, uh, to provide permanent financial support for habitat work on our state's public lands. Um, it's really a really great resource. Um, donate, and what's really cool about it is donations made to the fund, um, some are made directly through NRF or via the Cherish website, cherishwisconsin.org. Um, but largely the donations come through like $2, $5 donations when hunters or anglers purchase their licenses through the DNR's Go Wild system. So we've already raised nearly, we're almost at $1 million, I was just checking, from these voluntary small contributions from citizens across the state who really cherish Wisconsin. Um, and what's great about that is actually the last, actually all of the projects that have been funded through the Cherish Fund so far have been at state natural areas. Um, so places like the Lower Chippewa River Basin, State Natural Area, Bluff Creek and Clover Valley Fen, and the Southern Kettles, and then Lawrence Creek in central Wisconsin. So that's just a really great tool. It's wonderful that it's connecting people who care, you know, through these small voluntary contributions, but it all adds up to a big impact. So. We're super grateful to be supporting state natural areas and I'll be around um, for the Q&A afterwards if any folks have specific questions. So I'll turn it back over to Jared. And just okay. one quick reminder uh, from Jamie, uh, folks, you can continue to ask questions down in the chat function. If you hover on your screen, there should be a gray bar that pops up towards the bottom. In the middle, there's a little chat icon. Um, and then you can go ahead and send a question and Thomas Meyer is monitoring those and we'll answer and we'll also be pulling those at the end and sharing out the Q&A online. So please continue to use that if you have questions. Thanks. Okay, great. So um, as a reminder, we are in a pandemic. Before we get into the um, tour of the sites, um, travel close to your location and maybe keep some of these spots in your back pocket for later um, if you're far away from them. You can monitor our DNR COVID-19 page for up-to-date information on any changes. So I'm going to um, highlight these sites. Um, I am based out of Fitchburg which is near Madison and so the southern third of the state is what I'm most familiar with and have experience working at since 2008. Um, and I threw Maiden Rock Bluff in there um, as well um, because it's a cool spot. But as um, I want to mention too, like you, you don't have to limit your questions to just these sites. You can also ask questions about other state natural areas. Um, and Thomas has a significant amount of experience on sites that are um, more in the north. So um, feel free to ask additional questions if you have them. So I'm gonna give you a slide that looks kind of like this for each site. And so it's got some icons over here on the left. Um, it says how big the site is, Lulu Lake, which is a large site in Southeast Wisconsin. And the camera gives you an indication of how likely you're going to see some landscape level photos there. This is on a 1 to 10 scale, and this is my very loose estimate. Um, the unicorn is the number of rare plants and animals that are present at the site. The mountain is how steep the site is. So Lulu Lake has some steep features. It's up and down, but it doesn't have as dramatic of uh, elevation changes as the um, Mississippi River Bluff sites do. And then the climber on the bottom is uh, a rating of how challenging it is to get into these sites, how adventurous you need to be. So this is a, a map of the site. Um, you'll find this on our State Natural Area webpage 
for each site, each state natural area, and it shows where the property boundaries are and where you can access the site. Um, it also shows if other partners own parts of the site, and you'll see here the Nature Conservancy owns this orange section. There's actually a parking lot here, and you can walk about a two mile trail that goes somewhere like this and see the site that way. You can also come down to County J and park at this parking lot and walk up some truck trails through some restored prairie into some nice woods and wetlands and the trail curves towards the lake and ends about there. The other thing that I would recommend if you don't mind going off trail is to get on top of one of these long ridges because they're very prominent features. They have great oak trees on them and you can see a long ways if, there's, if there are no leaves on the trees and you can explore the site that way. I'm gonna zoom in to this section over here, about a hundred acre piece that's been managed most consistently in the last 12 years uh, by DNR and so it's in really good shape. So this is a zoomed in version or zoomed in map of uh, this section of property. It has very typical kettle moraine topography. Um, if you notice, it's hard to tell what's up and what's down on this map. Um, that's very typical of the kettles. So I recommend that you bring a, a, a compass with you um, because if you get in the center of this 100 acre property, you can get turned around. But if you just walk in one direction, eventually you will uh, hit a road or a feature that you can recognize. Um, it has uh, kettles that were formed um, by the glaciers because as the glaciers pushed a bunch of rubble and rock, there were ice chunks mixed in. And when the glaciers re retreated, those ice chunks melted, forming bowls that were called kettles. So those features are really cool on this site, as well as the oaks. Um, there's lots of really great, cool oak trees. And the other um, great feature of this site is the wetlands. So um, the oaks are um, real open. They allow you to see a long ways and you can also see a long ways from these little knobs that form uh, hill prairies, usually on south and southwest, southwest facing slopes. If you get on the top of one of these knobs or ridges, you can see into the wetlands um, a long ways. And this photo is, is great, it shows both the wetlands in the foreground, the oaks in the background, and you can see how open it is because you can still see the ground um, back here and the topography in the hills. Notice there's a hill prairie over here on the top of this hill. So if you get on the top of there, you've got some pretty incredible views. It's just a really stunning sight. Uh, this is the McQuanago River that runs into Lulu Lake itself. And this is the Nature, the Nature Conservancy Trail here. The really awesome feature of the wetlands is the fen plant community. Fens are rare because they're uncommon to begin with and they're sensitive to changes in hydrology and land use. Um, they require an upwelling of groundwater that um, usually bring some nutrients from the ground, but it also is constantly flowing. And so because of that, there's little available oxygen for plants, much like in a wetland. And so the plants that do uh, live there tend to be pretty small and they happen to have some pretty awesome flowers though. And they like to bloom in late August and early September. So it's a great time to visit the fen. So the fen usually sets up over here along the edge of wetlands, usually on a slight slope. Um, this is a great goldenrod show and a lot of these goldenrods are not your typical common goldenrods that you might find in uplands. These are more conservative ones like Ohio goldenrod, Riddell's goldenrod, and bog goldenrod, as well as maybe swamp goldenrod. Um, so I'm going to show you some close-up photos courtesy of Josh Mayer, 
who's been to lots of state natural areas, takes great photos. You can go to his Flickr page and, and do a virtual tour yourself of more state natural areas. Um, I've also got a little graphic here telling you the name of the plant, but if you're like me and you just like cool photos, you can focus on that and go to um, the PDF that we will have posted later on to find um, the ID for each photo. So this is false foxglove. This is a close-up of an aster. It's amazing what a close-up photo will show you, um, the details of the flowers. This is bog goldenrod, as I was referring to before. This is fringed gentian, just a beautiful flower. This is grass of Parnassus, and it's believed, some believe that the lines on the petals direct pollinators towards where the, the goodies of the flower are. This is a, a very small but common um, plant that you'll find in fens called Combs lobelia. A lot of these plants will also set up in calcareous areas along the edges of wetlands. Um, Lake Michigan has a lot of these. Sometimes you also find them in sedge meadows. This is a uh, lady's tresses orchid. This is sneezeweed, which you might not think of being super beautiful unless you're zoomed in on it. But zoomed in, it, it looks awesome too. Uh, swamp lousewort and turtle head. So that's Lulu Lake, which was this purple dot. We're going to go up to Rocky Run, which is a yellow dot in Columbia County. So Rocky Run is 455 acres in size. It has a similar level of topography to Lulu Lake. Um, although if you walk some of the truck trails that I will, will show you, there isn't much topography at all. And so if you walk those trails, you don't need to be super adventurous, but, you, but if you want to get to this spot, to take this photo, then you would have to traverse some hills and be a, a little bit more adventurous off trail. So the title photo was from Rocky Run. You can see some of the views. Here's an aerial photo and you've got three access points. Dunning Road has two access points and then over on Highway 22, there's an access point. And this truck trail that runs all the way along site is, um, what you can use to access the site. This area in here, actually the, the photos that you saw were taken right about here. And the best part of the site is gonna be in this area here. So you also notice that the um, site grades from being sandy and a little bit more sparse in trees on the west, as you move east, there becomes more uh, trees and richer soil. So it changes from oak barrens uh, to a white oak woodland. And there's a prominent ridge that runs the length of the site. And so actually the topography is not that complicated. If you get into the center of the site, you'll think, oh man, I, I get lost in here. But if you remember that if you walk straight up, you'll come to a field or a feature that you'll recognize if you walk straight down, you'll come to either the truck trail or an open field. Um, it's not as hard to get lost. I still recommend bringing a compass with you. Um, there's also a very prominent feature here, which is a box canyon. Um, there's about 20 to 40 foot cliffs that um, as you walk back into the canyon, they get closer and closer together. So that's a really cool feature um, to check out. And here is the steep, one of the steepest parts of the site. There are hill prairies on the tops of the slopes and white oak woods or oak savanna uh, down below. Here are volunteers are collecting um, seeds. 
There's a lot of lead plant on the site. This blooms in late June. It really likes the partial shade as well as the open prairies. And the prairies are just covered in prairie clovers, purple and white both. They're just solid. Um, they usually bloom in early to mid-July. The site is also really beautiful in the fall when the oaks turn um, their dark shades of red and brown. So that usually occurs in late October, early November. But the real star of the site is both the oak structure uh, and the understory intact below it. It's the two thirds of Wisconsin has a lot of um, woodland plant communities, um, even some in the north. Um, but it's it's very common to find with the lack of fire for the last 150 years, many more oaks than would have historically been there. Um, and if we do happen to find an area that has this oak structure with scattered oak trees, often the understory is pretty degraded because it was recently pastured, or there may be species like cherry, maple, basswood, um, more shade tolerant species that are filling in. Um, and so usually there's not native understory um, underneath the scattered oaks, but this site has both. And that's primarily because of the prescribed fire that's been used here. We burn the site every two to three times, two to three times every four years. And um, because of that, it's constantly changing. Um, these oak trees will develop wounds at the base. Um, a lot of these, these oaks in this picture are black and red oaks, and they're not quite as fire tolerant or as long lived. Um, and so they will, especially once they get to a certain size, once they, um, you've had 10, 15 fires, there's a wound that develops at the base of the trunk and the trees are more vulnerable to being blown over um, by wind. And so this big shade tree here is putting out a lot of shade. So eventually it will get blown over and these younger trees will fill in and provide shade over in this area. So it's a constantly changing environment due to um, prescribed fire. This shows the great uh, oak structure as well. Scattered trees in the lower slopes, hill prairies at the top. And this is photo of the wide oak woodland. Um, also a beautiful area. It's very, very open. Um, not like what you would expect to find in your average Wisconsin woodland. Um, easy to walk through. And you can see the characteristics of the trees. It's also great to visit um, late May, uh, mid to late May when the geraniums are blooming and late July to early August when the, the sunflowers are blooming. So I'm gonna zoom into this middle section, which is where our volunteers have been working the most. Um, we have volunteer work days out here, typically in, in normal conditions. Um, the first uh, Thursday of the month from nine to noon, and we have work days also in the winter on Saturdays. So in the winter time, we will um, remove unwanted trees and brush by making fires. I should note that there are pine plantations here and we are planning to remove those pine plantations and already actively beginning that process because native plants and animals do not find valuable habitat or much valuable habitat in pine plantations. Um, especially the native plants and animals that would have been historically, that, that are in oak barrens. So here's a, a before photo of a work day and an after photo. You can see we cleared out a bunch of red cedar. And it's really great when an area that you cleared responds well, and this particular area did respond well. Not every area does, um, but we had an incredible amount of prairie smoke that came up as well as pussy toes um, in this particular spot. And so we will collect from good areas. Here's a prairie smoke seed. 
and we'll plant that in our um, harvested pine plantation and turn that pine plantation back into oak um, barrens and sand prairie by scattering seeds that we collected. So that's Rocky Run. Now we're going to go up to Main Rock Bluff, which isn't too far from the Twin Cities and Eau Claire. So Main Rock Bluff is a very steep site, um, and it's also got really awesome picture opportunities, which is part of the reason why I included it. Um, it's 263 acres, and you can see it's right by Lake Pepin, um, and it has these other cool bluffs and great oak trees as well. But there is a trail that you can use to access the site. So um, you would park here and you would walk roughly uh, something like this to get back to a viewing spot right here. And this is the view from the top. There's also a few cool plants that um, just get into the state on this site and uh, the western um, bluffs along the Mississippi River. Um, site plants that are more likely to be present in the Great Plains, and this is uh, the very farthest east of their range. So uh, one of the issues at Maiden Rock Bluff and many other driftless area sites, especially south and west facing hillsides, is they were historically hill prairies, but now they are red cedar forests. And so one of the first jobs is to remove the red cedar um, burn it up into uh, in brush piles and then uh, deal with whatever uh, non-natives come up which is what we're doing and volunteers are doing in this picture they're cutting and treating uh, buckthorn that came up after cedar was removed and um, more sun came in and then we're also scattering some seeds uh, sometimes native seeds come in and that's what you're hoping for um, but not always. And so in this photo, volunteers are collecting Canada rye and bottle brush. And I think this particular seed probably went towards um, an oak savanna restoration where they were removing some of the more mesic tree species I was talking about before, like cherry, basswood, um, non-oaks and hickories, and scattering the seeds there to re return it to a savanna. So if you haven't been here in five to 10 years, it's changed a lot. Um, so I wanna take a quick uh, few minutes to um, see if there are any questions that have come up. Uh, do we have any questions from the chat box that uh, need to be answered? This is Jamie, can you remind me, are you able to view the chat box on your end or is that hidden because of the shared screen? I can see it, yep. Okay. Jared, this is Thomas. Uh, the only question that hasn't been answered is the last one from Jan Morlick. She asked, Jared, can you talk a bit more about the plant species that you mentioned found at Maiden Rock Bluff that are more typically found further west? Yeah, um, I was afraid I would get that question. I don't know specifics, um, the specific plants. Um, I, I think there is, I don't want to guess because um, I might get it wrong. So I, I think uh, we, can, we can find the answer for that um, and, and send out an answer uh, later on. Jared, I, um, I'll... Um use the chat feature to answer that question. Thanks. Okay. Jared, this is Jamie. I have a question. Um, since the volunteer program has been temporarily paused with COVID, have you all noticed any, or, or will there be any negative impacts on these areas that usually depend on the volunteer program to, for the maintenance? Yeah, um, there are some, some, so for example, um, we're just getting into the growing season right now. Um, and garlic mustard is the, one of the first invasive that's being dealt with. Um, there's still time to control garlic mustard, but um, the longer 
we are not able to get to garlic and mustard, um, the increasing chance that we might go a year without controlling it, and each year is is hard to recover from that you don't do something. And so I think once we get into the growing season, it's really going to start impacting our sites more and more. Um, we are unable to do prescribed burns right now, so that is a challenge, um, but missing out on one fire season is probably not the end of the world. Although, um, if it, you know, if it, if it's regular that fire doesn't happen, then it's not a good thing. Um, so that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, so I will go ahead and keep going here. So we're going to go to the Lower Wisconsin State Riverway here, these red dots. And I've got, um, on these next couple ones, I've got two for ones because they're uh, very close to each other and they offer slightly different things. So the first site's Blue River Sand Barrens. This is in Grant County. It's 129 acres in size. And these are cactus. Um, Wisconsin has a couple native cactus um, plants. Um, one is Eastern Prickly Pear, the other is Brittle Prickly Pear. Um, Blue River Sand Barrens is not as steep, um, but it does have more topography than you might expect just uh, getting to the site. And it does require off-trail hiking, um, but much of it is open and fairly easy to walk through. So the the western half of the site has active, some active sand dunes and sand prairie, and the eastern half has uh, black oak and hills oak savanna. It is right along the Wisconsin River, and the river is actually very high in this photo, so it's not, the water is normally not this high, um, but along the Wisconsin River is where you'll find an abundance of uh, oak uh, barrens, which is a globally rare plant community. This is a close-up of the eastern prickly pear. You'll see that um, it's got these little bitty hairs here, which is actually the part of the prickly pear that's really going to cause the most uh, annoyance. These hairs will get in your ankles if you're wearing shorts or if you touch them with your hands, they'll get in your hands, and they'll um, just really cause a lot of irritation. Um, the plants are great food sources. Both the pads and the fruit are eaten by a bunch of small rodents and animals, as well as turtles. There's a great display of bird's foot violet here, um, which usually occurs uh, middle to late May. There's also a lot of other cool sand loving plants like lichens, which can't survive if there's a lot of uh, vegetation, but they like some of the more bare areas. Um, and earth star fungus, which when they um, mature, they expand and pop open. This is my um, favorite spot on the site because this is an actively moving sand dune. Um, when winds blow really strong, it'll blow this bare sand and it'll deposit it over here on this side of the sand dune, similar to what a snowdrift would be like. The top of it is, is bare sand and it's very tough conditions for any plants to grow in, but there are a few that will sometimes try and sometimes be successful. Um, coastal jointweed and Hudsonia are a couple. Um, and plants will often grow more in areas where there are a few oak trees and, and there's a little bit more shade and conditions aren't quite as, um, as tough. But the open sand does provide some really cool viewing of insects that like to burrow in the sand and bask on a, a cool sunny day. 
and that's what we were doing. We were on an NRF field trip, and uh, we're looking at grasshoppers and other insects that were just flying around on the sand dunes. And we also came across this guy, a uh, six-lined race runner, which likes um, sandy areas along uh, Wisconsin's big rivers. And we were lucky enough to actually be able to, to see it up close. They're just really intricate little creatures. They have great speed, but poor endurance. So if you want to see one up close, um, you can just uh, chase it a couple times and then it gets tired and it has to, has to stop and rest. Um, so there is, like I said, some topography. This photo shows a little bit of that, um, but not, you know, not really doing it justice. There are volunteers that work out here. Um, we work in the winter time typically at this site. Uh, and in this picture, we're removing unwanted trees and brush from uh, the edge of the wetland. Um, hopefully native plants will fill in now and it will be easier for turtles to migrate from the wetland into the sand barrens where they like to lay their nests in the loose sand, um, which is part of the reason why we were um, managing this area that had never really been managed before. And uh, since there's those pine plantations are nearby, um, we're always uh, doing some, well, recently we've done a lot more pine removal. So we're just gonna go down the road now to Blue River Bluffs in Grant County. Uh, this is a steep site, uh, there are no trails. So everything that you explore here would be off trail, but I'm gonna give you a little potential hike. Um, if you were to park here on this dead end road, Cheesick Road, you could walk it and then walk up this hill prairie, which from the road looks like this. So it is very steep, but there is not too much um, brush to obstruct your way. And you get to the top of this ridge and you can walk this ridge, which gets, which gets really narrow and has great views all the way around, just following the top of this ridge, and then down and back to your car. So you can make a little bit of a loop of it. There's no trail and there is some thorns, but um, it's not too challenging of a, of a walk once you get up to the top of the hill. The other area that I'll highlight on this other property is over here, which has an exceptional barrens and very cool hill prairie. Oops. So this is the um, the ridge that I was talking about. You can see it it drops off on both sides. I also have a 1940s aerial photo um, that shows some really cool things. And this is typical of a lot of the driftless area. Notice the uh, hill prairies are are very big, and even this slope here which you can focus in on has scattered oak trees. And if you jump to 95, which is the next photo I have, notice the change. That whole slope fills in and now there's a bunch of cedar on these hill prairies because this site probably, this site was not, did not have any prescribed fire. And so um, it has filled in with lots of trees. We do have a crew that has worked out here and has cleared a lot of the cedar. So now in 2015, you'll notice that there are hill prairies on these slopes again. But we may never get back to um, the 1940 um, aerial, aerial photos. We might with continued prescribed fire over time, um, but um, we're, we're not 100% sure. This is the other area that I'm gonna um, look at. It's an exceptional oak barrens. When we do conduct prescribed fires on these sites, 
uh, there are some challenges because there are invertebrates that are rare that live on these hill prairies. They lay their eggs at the base of the slope and in the stems of these plants. And um, in order for them to colonize much quicker after a prescribed fire, um, we leave areas unburned. And so there is a crew that is putting in an unburned area over here in this photo, in the middle of this photo. Oops. And it requires some planning and a significant amount of work to do that on these steep slopes where the fire, fire is um, likely to carry. But it makes for some great aerial photos. There you can see the unburned area here and here. Um, we've talked about making SNA in the hillside, but we haven't quite pulled that off yet. And there you can see the unburned area here. And again, this is uh, the other site, we call it the Ellenbolt property. Um, and this is the Oak Barrens. I'm gonna show you a photo of this. Unfortunately, I don't have too many photos, but it's just super diverse place. If you go there every couple weeks, you'll see different flowers blooming. So this is a photo of the lupin, um, which probably occurs in late May, early June. And then I'm going to show you some photos of other plants present on the site, including yellow star grass. Just a really small, conservative little plant. That's beautiful. The really showy wood lily. And this plant is really cool. It's called narrow leaf dayflower. It's a special concern in Wisconsin. Um, and you may be familiar with the garden variety, Asiatic dayflower, um, but this one is much more subtle and is, is really gorgeous and cool to see in the wild. So now we're going to jump down to um, southwestern Wisconsin. First we'll start at Cassville Bluffs. The site is in uh, Grant County. It's uh, super steep and requires some adventuring to get to it. Um, you can walk up the bluff here. Uh, this is Mississippi Valley property. To get up to the top, um, there is a road that you can take. Uh, the best parts of the site are back in the back corner. The reason that I bring this site up is an aerial photo. You can see there are some hill prairies here. The reason I bring this site up is because it has chinkapin oak savanna, and it also is, is gonna be less likely that you'll encounter people um, since the other site is Dewey Heights Prairie within a state park. Chinkapin oaks are special concern trees in Wisconsin, um, and, and they're only found along the Mississippi River and in southeast Wisconsin. This particular tree is in southeast Wisconsin and I'm comparing it to the size that you'd normally find along the Mississippi River. This one is huge. Mississippi River trees are much smaller, um, but they are a very cool tree. They like to lean over towards where the sun is. Um, they have white oak bark. Uh, it looks a little bit like white oak bark, um, but it's sometimes a little shaggier um, and they have odd looking leaves. Um, unlike any other oak tree in Wisconsin. It's thought that they may be a very important plant for climate change because it's, they're at the northern edge of their range right now. And um, when things can, if things change in Wisconsin, they may move north. Here's some cocoons we left un, unburned. If you get up to the top of this site, the only thing that will be between you and the river is a railroad track. There are no roads down there. Then the last site is uh, Dewey Heights Prairie. It is within Dewey Heights State Park. It's currently closed on Wednesdays and it's open from, uh, open until 7 p.m. Has some exceptional hill prairies. Uh, tons and tons of rare plants and animals are present here and you can drive to the top. So it's really easy to access. 
This is an aerial photo, and so the road comes up like this. Um, here's the end of the road, and the hill prairies are pretty large in size. Here's the aerial photo, so you can see the hills are very steep here, or a, a topographic map. You can see the hills are steep. Great views. You can just get out your out of your car and you're on a hill prairie. So here's a photo of us conducting a prescribed burn using the wind and the slope to put in a, a refugia, an unburned area. And I'll show you a, a few of the common plants and a couple of the uncommon ones. So this is blue-eyed grass, prairie phlox, fringed pecoon, wood betony, which is probably blooming now or will be soon. And this is a photo by Thomas of a uh, jeweled shooting star. It is um, an endemic that's only found in the driftless area. It's the only place in the world that it's found. Um, it has these really great pink to dark purple flowers and it blooms much earlier than our common shooting star. Um, it's probably blooming now or is going to be blooming very soon. And it usually is on rocky um, outcroppings. Um, it can grow in very little soil. The other cool plant that we just found out there recently is mullein foxglove. This is a special concern plant um, that is present here in a crazy abundance. Uh, and it gets very tall. It's about six, seven feet tall. Um, and the flowers are great for um, hummingbirds. It is only present on a few sites in the state. Um, but like I said, it's, it's everywhere at, at Dewey Heights. So very cool. And then just some uh, landscape level shots. A lot of cool rocky outcroppings here. And there's some trails that you can use to explore the prairie. Um, luckily, there isn't too much use here. I think that's the last photo that I have. So do we have more questions? Let's see. I'll check the chat box. It's here. And I was going to say thanks, Jared. These are all sites that have um, that NRF has helped secure funding for. So it's so it's just so awesome to see the impact that some of this, you know, donations from our members are are having on the ground. Jared, this is Thomas. Um, I think we're all up to um, to speed on the chat um, on the chat end of things. Okay. Uh, Jamie, I don't know if you wanted to open this up for verbal questions, or do you want to stay with the, with the chat feature to do that? I think we'll stay with the chat just because we have um, about 100 people on the call with us right now, so I don't want to, it to get too crazy. Uh, there was one question, though, Jared, that I thought maybe you could expand on. I thought it was a really good one. Someone asked, um, you know, why does the WDNR and NRF, like, why are we trying to get these sites back to their historic uh, form versus just letting them, you know, be what they are today? What is the benefit to that? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good philosophical question. And my answer is usually, um, I just think it's cool to have a greater diversity on, um, the sites that we do have and and why not uh, try and I like our the native plants and animals that we have had um, historically they're still around they're still here in small numbers and so I think the more um, time and energy we spend um, increasing the amount of those plants and animals that that we have that are native is valuable and I, I think they're they're beautiful and they're worth um, spending time on. Thanks, Jared. And I think there's a, uh, a statistic, and I can't remember it exactly, that the WDNR shared before, that something like 90% of our native um, threatened or endangered Wisconsin wildlife and plant species are found on these SNAs. Is that 
more or less correct? I might not have the exact number. Yeah, I, I think it's somewhere around 70% of um, the listed plants and animals that we have in the state can be found somewhere on an SNA. Is that, is that about right, Thomas? Sorry, Jerry, can you ask that again? I was responding to a chat. Oh. Um, uh, Jamie was talking about the stat that um, a certain percentage of rare plants and animals were found on SNAs. And I said about, I think it's about 70% of the listed plants and animals can be found somewhere on an SNA. Is that correct? Yeah, actually, it's a little higher, Jared. Uh, we used 75% for the animals that are um, listed as endangered or threatened are found um, on state natural areas. We have more than 90% of listed plant okay. species that occur on, uh, at least one population occurs on state natural areas. So nine out of 10. Cool. That's great. Well, um, folks, it looks like there are no more questions trickling in. Um, and just to let you know, we will be posting this recording on our wisconservation.org website, um, also sharing it out on social media. Um, Jerry, did you happen to have a final slide that you wanted to share? Anything else? Uh, yeah, I have the additional resources that we had here. Oops. There you go. So everyone, if you want to watch this webinar again later at your own pace or view the PDF that we'll provide, so you can also click through the slides at your own pace without the audio, we'll have that posted on our website on our virtual field trips page and you can get to that by going to that first link, wisconservation.org. Right there on our homepage in the middle there's a, a photo and underneath it is a link to our virtual field trips page. Um, and you can find our other Field Trip Friday videos posted there. And those will be going on at least through probably mid-June and possibly longer into the summer until we can all be out on our field trips together again in person. Jared and Kate, Tom, did you have anything else to add before we wrap up here? Just a huge thanks to Jared and Thomas and the rest of the SNA program for all the awesome work that you guys are doing. You bet. Glad that we could share uh, some photos and uh, glad that people get a chance to see some more of these sites, even though they're, they're still at home. Fantastic. And if you guys all liked this SNA presentation, we focused more on Southern Wisconsin, but uh, Thomas Meyer, who was joining us today and answering some questions, he'll be doing another SNA tour uh, more broadly of all of Wisconsin, and that'll be coming up in a few weeks on our Field Trip Friday. Mm -hmm.